Hi folks, welcome back to Empire of the Sun Basics. Today we're going to take a look at playing the Allies in the campaign. And we will be looking at the 1942 campaign start because that's the standard one. It's used in tournaments. There's probably a little more balance there than the 1941 start. Uh, and for those who are just wondering about the 41 start, I would recommend that as a fun, solitaire experience. Um, once you have some experience with the game, it's basically just the Japanese turn. And the real difference is not actually what happens at Pearl Harbor, although you do roll the dice over there and you can get slightly different outcomes. Uh, if you're interested in seriously different outcomes at Pearl Harbor, just start in 1942 and take the U.S. CVs off the board and assume they were sunk. You can always try that and see how that works. But uh, playing in 1941, a 1941 start to the campaign, is not going for that kind of variation. What it's actually looking at is um, how the Japanese might play their open uh, opening moves a bit differently. Uh, and as such, what you end up with as the Japanese player is basically a huge 26 activation surprise attack offensive that you get to conduct. And if you've played around a little bit with the game, that should sound fairly daunting because it is. For an experienced Japanese player, the 41 campaign start will provide a bit of an advantage. Uh, for a novice Japanese player, the 1941 campaign start will actually put you at a disadvantage versus the 1942 start. So with that out of the way, let's talk a bit about how we want to approach this. I'm going to split it into three parts. We'll talk a little bit about turns two and three, which I kind of think of as riding out the storm, uh, and then turns four through six or seven, are what I think of as the mid-war, and then kind of depending on the flow of the war and how things are going, uh, the late stage of the war typically starts around turn seven or so. But I think it works well to break general allied strategy down into those three phases. And we'll actually focus most on the mid-war because uh, that's where the allies, particularly a new allied player, tends to struggle the most. The early war basically turns two and three in the campaign. There's not a whole lot the Allies can do. That also means there's not too much the Allies can do to screw it up either. There are a few things that you can play optimally to help slow the uh, Japanese down, but, but turns two and three are more about playing as the Japanese, and so um, we'll, we'll focus more on those when I look at uh, how to play as, as the Japanese. But turns four through six or seven are really the tough part for the Allies because turn four is when you have to start making progress of war. And that's a major way that people lose the war uh, early is by failing to make progress of war. So we'll talk a lot about uh, how to do that. And then we'll spend a little bit talking about the late war. But but again, I think the, the critical part for new players is, is really getting successfully through the mid-war. And the, the discussion there will also help anybody who's interested in playing the 1943 scenario, which is a um, fairly common and probably, in fact, the most popular short scenario. So with that, let's get started. This is the situation at uh, turn two start of the campaign. And you can see, we'll just throw up the Japanese ZOIs here. So you can see that the Japanese have already invaded uh, the Philippines here and here and here. Uh, they've already marched down into Malaya, although they don't have air cover over there yet. And uh, Pearl Harbor has already happened as well. So this is the situation at the start of turn two. And over the course of turn two and turn three, what you can expect as the Allies is that the Japanese are going to complete the conquest of the Dutch East Indies, uh, of the Philippines, of Malaya. If they have a relatively typical hand, they'll complete the conquest of all three of those by the end of turn three, no problem. They will also complete the conquest of the Solomons, and they will have taken uh, at least some of the ports on the north coast of New Guinea. Uh, that's pretty typical. Honestly, there's not a whole lot you can do about it as the Allies, but uh, in, at least in terms of preventing that from happening. Uh, but there are a few things you can do to try and slow that down. And so one of those is that you have an emergency naval move at the start of, uh, actually before really turn two starts. Uh, and so what you're going to get to do is, um, let's just show you. So you've got this guy over here who's going to get to um, make an emergency naval move. He's typically not quite so critical, but he often gets moved over to this part of the world. 
he's not much of a speed bump in the sense that the Japanese often don't really get cranked up here in Burma. It sort of depends on their overall timeline, but, but they don't usually get cranked up in Burma until after they've completed the conquest of the other three. Where you can have a bigger impact and where you really can use your emergency naval moves as speed bumps is with this guy here, this guy here, you've got a naval unit here. Very typical emergency naval moves for the Allies would be to move this U.S. Asia cruiser squadron, which is reduced at this point, but move it to Biak. Biak is a port that the Japanese would like to grab on the northwest New Guinea coast. It's actually an island. And uh, by putting a unit there, you'll force a battle hex there. It's fairly common for the Japanese to come at the main Dutch strong point here through Batavia because uh, amphibious assaults are always a bit risky and you can see here the Dutch unit has got six attack strength and 12 defense strength and it's a two-step unit. Um, so that's a bit of a nut to crack particularly through amphibious assault and the Japanese would like to avoid taking unnecessary ground step casualties if they can so it's often common for the Japanese to come at the strong point through Batavia and march over land. So by taking the destroyer squadron and emergency naval moving it to Batavia here, uh, what you do is you force an additional battle hex at Batavia. And uh, then if you're doing that, it's also fairly common to take the Dutch light cruiser squadron and move it over here. Uh, because this is both the resource hex and one of the hexes that's necessary for the fall of the DEI. So uh, that forces another battle hex there where there otherwise wouldn't be one. So you can you get the picture here. What we're doing with these emergency naval moves is we're actually forcing the Japanese to incur more battle hexes than they otherwise um, would need. And if you've started to look at the logistical constraints in the game, there are several different types. The number of operations you have to run, which is equivalent to the number of cards that you've got. Uh, the number of unit activations, which is spelled out by a combination of the list logistics value of the card you use, coupled with the uh, HQ that you use that card with. But battle hexes is right up there uh, as a key constraint, because if you'll remember with military events, you are able to have as many battle hexes as you want. But if you're using a card for its OC value, rather than as a military event, uh, OC cards can only ever have one battle hex associated with that card play. Uh, and so, particularly in the first couple of turns, a big question for the Japanese is how many military events they get. And if they have two or three military events on turn two and another two or three military events on turn three, they're not going to have any problem with battle hexes, and there's not really anything you can do about it. But if they have just one military event, for example, on turn two and one military event on turn three, they're going to have some battle hex limitations. And so by putting out these speed bumps, you're going to force them to play more precisely to keep their plan on track. So think about using your emergency naval moves that way as the allies. Um, and in some games, it's not going to make much difference, but in games where the Japanese has some issues with his cards in the first couple of turns, it can make a big difference. Same thing down here with the Kent. This CA frequently will either go to Gili Gili or to Guadalcanal for the same purpose of forcing another battle hex. Another question for the Allies, which actually is a beginning of the game question, is whether to take the Arcadia Conference card uh, in your hand. You're only going to have five cards on turn two. Um, you can take, if you want, one of those cards can be the Arcadia Conference. And so to take that or not is the question. And if we go up here, you'll see that the Allies have it in their hand here. Uh, and the Arcadia Conference really is about two things. For the most part, in the early game, it's about whether or not you're going to get the uh, ABDA headquarters unit. And if you can get the ABDA headquarters into somewhere in the... the um, Dutch East Indies, um, it can, and, and keep it alive and get a ground, an Australian ground unit in there. Um, that can be a real thorn in the side for the Allies. Uh, a competent Japanese player will not allow you to do that. Uh, so part of the question is, who are you up against? Um, if you're 
uh, a couple of novice players playing against each other. Have a good time. See if you can get the ABDA HQ established in the DEI. And the act of going about trying to do that and the Japanese player trying to stop it will be useful experience for both of you. If you're playing against an experienced Japanese player, you really need to assume that he's going to play in such a way that you will not be able to keep the, D, the uh, ABDA HQ on the board very long. Uh, it's not going to really be useful to you as an HQ. And then the question really revolves around the other use of the Arcadia Conference card, and that is that it ends ISR. Uh, and you'll note this particular card is a remove from play if used as an event card. Uh, that means if you play it for ABDA on turn two, you are basically, you're going to be at a point when you're not under ISR. Uh, ending ISR is not going to be any value to you. Early in the game, turn two or three for the allies, ISR doesn't really matter anyway. It's, it's a bigger issue later. Um, so you're going to essentially be throwing away a potential ISR ending card. So one way to look at it is, you know, to, to say, I'm not going to take the Arcadia Conference card. Uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to get a normal five hand draw for turn two and leave the Arcadia card in the deck. And what that does is it puts an extra ISR ending card in the deck to potentially come up later in the game at a point where it actually would be more used to you as an ISR ending card. So I think that's a, a valid strategy to consider as the allies. And in particular, if you are thinking that you like to try and play aggressively and might want to try and, and do, try a, a plan orange type of um, staging into the Philippines, one of the challenges for that is it helps to have some cards that actually have some reasonable OC value so you can move units. If you only have one and two OC cards, you're not going to be able to get very far. And if we go back and look again, you'll notice the Arcadia Conference is a one OC card here. Um, so not taking the Arcadia card gives you an opportunity to draw an extra card that might be a two or a three OC card that might uh, help support uh, some type of plant orange. So that leads to the next question is, uh, which is, should you try uh, Plan Orange? Does it make sense to go for Plan Orange? I guess I would suggest when you're just getting going in the game, trying to play aggressively into the Philippines on, uh, well, turn three for a lot of players, turn two for some players. But this early in the game, it's extremely risky, and you really need to know what you're doing. If you want to give it a shot, have fun with it. But in terms of just learning how the game plays, that would not be my approach. I would probably stick to a more conservative, um, typical kind of allied response, which is a little bit more sitting back and waiting. So if you're not going with a plain orange type of operation on turn two or three, what are some of the things that you might actually want to do with your cards? The first thing that comes to mind is to set your defense in the CBI, particularly Burma. You'll notice that Rangoon is not particularly heavily defended. There's one division there, and there's one division on the border uh, out front, but those are very low-value units that are easily destroyed by the Japanese, and so you'll want to get at least one of the Indian Corps into Rangoon. You've got another one back here. You have to decide how far forward you want to defend with both corps, but putting uh, somebody into Rangoon to make it tougher to take and bringing the Chinese out is something that can uh, take one or two cards, depending on uh, how far you can move with the card. So, for example, because these three strategic routes haven't been built, it's actually going to cost three movement points to get this core into Rangoon. It's two for the first hex and then one more for the next two hexes. So if you don't have a 3 OC, it'll take you two cards to get there. Um, same thing moving the Chinese out and also just depending on with, with the low efficiency value of SEAC, unless you have a good event, uh, it's fairly typical that to actually move out all the Chinese uh, and do everything you want to do, it might take you a couple of cards over here. So setting your defense in Burma is one of the things that the allies will most commonly do with a very early card or two uh, on turn two in the campaign. Something you don't want to be tempted to do is to move the 10th U.S. Corps forward from Oahu. Um, you really need that core there to make sure that the Japanese don't pull off uh, any nasty surprises. Uh, so just don't be tempted to push it out to the Pacific and do something aggressive with it. What about attacking something? There's a general rule for the Allies that they're usually looking to trade with the Japanese as much as possible because they have a much better replacement situation, uh, particularly with respect to air. Um, so it's often a good thing for the Allies to be aggressive and to try and go after the Japanese and be willing to uh, swap 
step losses with them. But you have to be a little careful when you do that. There are a couple things in the early game that can get you in trouble. One is you'll notice over in the CBI, in the early going, there's the uh, American Volunteer Group and the Far East Air Unit. Those are both pretty weak units. You've also got um, the uh, CA, which may have been moved forward with your emergency naval move. But uh, uh, one way or another, on turn two, you have very weak forces over here. Uh, one of the things you'll notice with the Japanese is they've got some of their elite air. Uh, let's see, here we go. There is the 22nd Air Flotilla there. And then the Japanese have uh, elite air here. They've got more elite air here. Uh, they've got lots more uh, elite air scattered all around. Uh, and a lot of the uh, Japanese air tends to get pushed out in the early part of turn two. So you'll wind up, one of the Japanese strategies for dealing with ISR is they tend to move their army air to the CBI and their naval air into the Pacific just because there's rarely a need to move uh, Navy units in the CBI. And so just pairing up that way works well in dealing with ISR. So if you end up with three or four uh, elite Army air units within striking range uh, for reaction over here, then going after anything early on uh, with these guys is really just looking to get them wiped out. Uh, and even on turn three, if we take a quick look at the, look, not at the hand, let's look at the reinforcements. Um, so you'll notice um, this says turn two here, but reinforcements are going to be delayed. So these turn two reinforcements are actually in the delay box and will be coming in on turn three. So on turn three, uh, the Commonwealth will have a couple of decent naval units plus the SEAC unit. So it puts you in a position of potentially being able to actually do some damage to the Japanese in the CBI. That's certainly something to think about. Um, you just have to be careful that you do it in a way that you don't give the Japanese a sort of an easy free opportunity to smash a couple of your units without you being able to do some good damage in return. A way that the Allies can minimize risk and still potentially do some damage to the Japanese is to use lower OC value cards like the Arcadia Conference. Uh, if we look at the hand here, you'll notice it's a 1 OC. The intelligence value is 1. That's typical for a 1 OC card. That means the Japanese essentially have to roll a 0 or 1 to get intercept on that card. Now, if you move into their ZOI, they're going to get a two minus two DRM. So that zero to one becomes a zero to three. And so instead of a 20% chance of intercept, they have a 40%. So you got to watch out uh, about that. But if we look up here at this situation, for example, you've got this army sitting on the board and the 15th army doesn't have any air support at the moment. You've got the American volunteer group that's sitting there with six and the FE air unit has seven, so combined there are 13 strength against this unit. The one trick is that on a one OC, this unit's only going to be able to move one. If it moves here, it, it's out of range. If it moves extended range, it can't attack because it's, it's got a parenthesized extended range. Both of them do actually, but in this case, the FE is the one that's moving. So that's one of the downsides of some of the early war units for the Allies is they have uh, the parenthesized extended range and they can't move as far and still be able to attack. So you'd have to actually think about it and as part of your redeployment, move the FE forward to Akiab so that when you were then going to attack, perhaps using the Arcadia card to attack, uh, you just you move him up one. Now they're both within two, but there's no there's no Japanese ZOI that we've moved into, and just attacking. Uh, well, in fact, the unit's not even actually in a Japanese ZOI, but attacking a unit in a ZOI is also not enough uh, to get the die roll modifier. So in a case like that, where the Japanese only has a 20% chance of intercept, uh, that means you've got an 80% chance of surprise, assuming that they don't have a reaction card. And that gives you a very good chance as the allies of actually flipping that ground unit. And that then sort of slows down their whole offensive quite a bit if they've just lost a step out on that ground unit before they can even get cranked up. So as the allies, you try to find little things like that and do them in ways that minimize the risk to you uh, that you'll take uh, unnecessary casualties. Once this strong elite air starts to get whittled down, it's, it's much less of a risk for you over here. The, um, the other uh, place that you can potentially do some damage on turn two is 
you've got a couple of carriers sitting over here in Pearl Harbor, and it can be tempting to do something like um, send them off for a carrier raid here in the Marshalls, um, where you've got a couple of nice tempting targets. Or if you've got potentially some naval forces pushed out here in the Solomon's New Guinea area with nobody to uh, with, with nobody else close by, it can be tempting to send your carriers down there and uh, hit the guys in this area. No reason not to do that as long as, because again, it's always good to trade when you can. What you have to remember is that you absolutely do not want to be in a position of losing your carriers or worse yet, your entire fleet. So just be sure if you do that, that you've calculated his reaction potential carefully and that there's no way that he's going to be able to wipe out both of your carriers, much less your entire fleet. If we think about turn three and sort of ask the broader question, how could we use turn two and in particular turn three when we have a few more horses on the board? If we go back up here and look at the charts, from an Allied perspective, we're going to have a little bit more of a Navy here. We're going to have a Marine Air Wing and a couple of Marine Brigades, as well as some Army Air and Army Corps. So we've got a lot of stuff that's coming in on turn three. At least it feels like a lot compared to what we start the game with. And we'd like to do something fun to set ourselves up in a good position uh, to go forward. So what are some things we could do there? Here's one particular situation at the start of turn three. And if we turn on the Japanese ZOIs, you'll notice a couple things. First of all, the Japanese have, uh, you can tell by the faint flags here, the Japanese have taken all of uh, the Solomons. And so this is an opportunity, and I think I showed this in one of the other videos. It just presents a good opportunity for the Allies to try and, and grab a base here, even though it's only turn three, so we don't need progress of war yet. But what the lack of a Japanese ZOI over the Solomons does is it gives us the opportunity to grab something like this is a naval base here at Bougainville uh, and the Allies would dearly love to get a toehold in the Solomons for free and uh, as a result of the Japanese not having sufficient activations to get an air unit down here that's something that the Allies could take a look at. Uh, something else they can do is, is push forward into New Guinea. The New Guinea hexes were not taken uh, by the Japanese but uh, they could be, uh, and the Japanese would probably like to in turn three. So one of the things the Allies might want to do as quickly as possible is to start pushing forward to Lei or to uh, Wewak to make sure that they can hold on to those hexes. And, and you'll see here now they've got some seri more serious ground forces there. There's a U.S. Uh, Army Corps uh, over here. We've also got a Special Forces Brigade and uh, there's a Marine Brigade here. So there are actually some troops available to do this with. The other thing you'll notice is we do have MacArthur down here in this particular situation, along with the Australian Air. MacArthur was withdrawn on turn two in this particular game so that he could be brought back on uh, turn three uh, and be available in Australia. So that's some of the things you might think about doing in a turn three um, allied position. This is probably a great place to take a break, and we'll come back and take a look at the mid-war in part two.